I'm Mandy Altima-Stahl. I'm the archivist here at the Massillon Museum. I uh, am super excited to be able to share some of these tips for oral history interviews with you. Um, so if you have any questions along the way, please uh, feel free to um, feel free to uh, put them in the comments there underneath this video, and uh, we will we will take care of those questions. So we're going to get started, and um, yeah, at any point in time, feel free to to ask questions, and then my contact information is at the end so that we can. Um, we can connect, and uh, if you're interested in signing up for uh, for this project, um, specifically the Missing History of Massillon, Unheard African American Stories, um, we are very excited to uh, be actively uh, gathering up stories, interviews, artifacts, anything that's related to African Americans in Massillon. So specifically why we are interested in um, oral histories uh, because they're they're really the the keystone of of history. Um, it's important for us to to document stories. Um, storytelling and written documents have been around for thousands of years. Um, textbooks and newspaper articles um, can give you a third person point of view. They don't give you what um, what a person uh, you know actually experienced. They're kind of a, a, a looking back. Uh, or reporting on something that happened, but not from that that original point of view. Uh, audio recordings have only been around since the 1850s, so it's a really new um, medium to be able to actually record people talking about their experiences. So, thinking of oral histories and why they're important, what what can these these stories tell us? Um, a lot of times, you can see a lot of emotion uh, in people's um, in, in their faces and the way that they talk about an event, um, and you can really get a sense of uh, what happened during their lifetime. Um, this is a very different source uh, from a written account, uh, because again, you can hear that emotion um, and written words, uh, as we've all kind of uh, seen when we email or we post on social media, you can't really get the subtle nuances of, of what someone is saying. Um, it's very different from a textbook. Again, textbooks can kind of summarize overarching themes and um, some, some bigger issues, uh, but they don't get to the very individual stories. Uh, so oral histories would be a primary source, uh, which are typically uh, sought after. And um, secondary sources would be those textbooks, those newspaper articles, those things that are, are one step removed from, uh, from whatever story is being told. Uh, so why should we record these stories? Um, they're so important, and um, and especially as people pass away, they're kind of a snapshot of a person um, telling their history, and um, they're they're just so very important, especially for historians who are writing history, uh, for families who are uh, you know sharing their uh, their stories, um, you know, for people to be able to kind of hold hold on to to those people and their their experiences. Um, thinking of a, a recent news broadcast, um, you know what what strikes you the most when you're you're learning about a, a disaster or a, a positive story. Um, what always strikes me is is witness interviews and the people who saw, let's say, the California wildfires, and um, you know to see the the heartbreak, uh, the excitement, the um, you know the hopefulness in their in their face, in their in their voice. Uh, really, really helps to to tell the story. Um, you know, if it was just an, a you know a photograph of a fire and someone listing off statistics, it wouldn't really hit you quite in the same way uh, as as hearing from someone who maybe lost their home or you know helped others to safety. So that that is really why um, those those interviews are important. So just a, a few. Uh, types of uh, oral history projects that uh, are in existence that you may be interested in. Um, the Veterans Oral History Project is an amazing database of uh, artifacts, interviews, um, photographs, all related to uh, those who've served in the military. And um, uh, this is definitely a, a great um, you know, set of documents, and especially for historians, for students to engage with, for teachers to use as primary sources in the classroom. Um, you know, this is kind of like the, the goal 
uh, with any oral history project is to have so much great information that you can really learn about any aspect of um, of a war from the people who lived it. Um, and again, uh, why do we record things? Um, there are uh, on the Library of Congress, they're under Native American songs. Um, a lot of the songs of various um, American Indian tribes throughout the United States uh, were not recorded. Um, and starting in the 1890s, um, Thomas Edison actually went around and uh, started to record some of the dances. Um, and as sound recording got better, they recorded some of the songs um, because these weren't written down. There was no sheet music for you know early American Indians um, available. No one wrote them down. So um, in order to salvage that, um, to salvage those sounds, those dances, um, this is why this was very important for for those pieces to be saved. Um, likewise, um, in uh, in Brazil, they had um, a lot of uh, native languages that were spoken by various tribes that lived throughout the rainforest, and um, those recordings were all stored, unfortunately, in that museum that had burned. Um, and uh, so, you know, some of those are, are lost now forever that, um, you know, this is why we, we save what we save so that we can access these in the future. Um, Captain Pearl Nye uh, of the Ohio and Erie Canal, uh, he was actually born on a canal boat and uh, lived in Akron for most of his life. He uh, sings a lot of the songs of canal boat captains and workers and uh, gives several interviews there on the Library of Congress. Um, one of the uh, amazing projects in the 1930s during the, um, the recovery, uh, during the, um, the Great Depression, uh, they actually picked out specific groups to go and interview. And um, so this is the 1930s. I mean, this is a good um, 70 years after slavery had ended, but they did go around to communities and find um, some elder members who were in fact former slaves um, to document the voices of those who had actually lived in servitude to document the conditions to document um, you know their experiences um, and then you know we always think of history as a long long time ago but here we are um, you know big events have happened in our lifetimes as well which are also important to to gather um, so September 11th 2001 was a big uh, events. So uh, there was a huge oral history project surrounding that, talking to people, uh, you know, hopes, dreams, fears, uh, those who were actually there on uh, on the sites that were attacked. Um, that's a, a definitely a, an interesting one uh, that's definitely more recent and kind of easier sometimes to connect to um, because we have those same experiences. So uh, in thinking about um, uh, you know, specifically, we're, we're training today um, to hopefully inspire you to go and interview someone who might have a story, um, whether that is, um, you know, a, a family member or a member in your community. Um, we really want to uh, inspire the community to go out and interview itself, but also then share those interviews with us so that we can preserve them, we can share them, um, and uh, you know, everybody can enjoy the stories that, that everyone has to share. Um, so uh, when you want to approach a subject who might uh, have a great story to share, um, and everyone always thinks that they don't have a, a story to share, but they really, really do. Um, but everybody has something to offer, even if it's, as, if it's as simple as talking about the first time you got a television in your home, um, you know, that is a, a great story. And it seems like to that person, it was everyday life. But for those of us who are now many decades removed, that's a that's an exciting story to hear. So um, if your, uh, your subject, the person you wanna interview does not wish to be on camera, that's okay. Our best case scenario would be to record video and audio, um, but aud just audio is absolutely fine. Not everyone's comfortable having their image taken and you know being recorded in that way, and that's all right. Uh, if they don't want to be recorded at all, that's okay too. Um, you know, the written histories tradition goes back thousands of years, so you can easily have them write their answers uh, to the questions down on paper or type it up, uh, whatever is easiest for them. So the whole point of this project is to record stories in whatever form that takes. Um, so getting all of those things, um, you know, for posterity. Uh, knowing that someday we'll be gone, but what what stories can we share uh, with those to come after us? So it's important to schedule a time and make sure that there's plenty of time so that you aren't rushed through a story. Um, one of the greatest things about 
you know, interviewing people on camera about their life is, uh, you know, the, the unthought of questions, all of the, the things that a person can share uh, if you have the time to talk to them and go through basically their whole life. Um, it's often good to plan for two hours to, um, you know, that includes some setup time, uh, you know, getting your camera on a tripod or getting your microphone set up, testing your equipment, uh, doing the interview and then kind of wrapping up and packing up. Um, obviously, uh, this is going to be a little bit different um, since we are in a, a pandemic time. Um, so we're going to definitely encourage everyone to uh, observe safety, uh, wearing a mask, um, making sure that, um, you know, you're not endangering anyone. Um, so, you know, some of these things, even if it's, you know, quote, on camera, um, you know, we might be doing them over Zoom, we might be doing them from far away, um, and that's okay. We want to we wanna be safe while gathering all of these stories. So make sure to test your equipment in advance. Ensure that you know how it works, where all the buttons are. Uh, like this morning when I tried to set up this lovely Facebook Live event, I uh, did not know where all the buttons were. So, um, important to, to test in advance. Uh, make sure that your batteries are charged and full. It's never great to haul all of your equipment out to an interview that you've scheduled and then your batteries die and then you have nothing to record a story with. So very important. Um, we have a little bit of paperwork that we ask people to fill out, um, especially the waiver and permission form so that uh, we have permission to share that story, uh, to use that story for, um, for the exhibit and potential documentary that we are planning to do. Um, so basically it gives the museum permission to save their story and use it uh, in a very respectful way. Um, uh, you know, that's important too, that we're, we're definitely respecting everybody's stories and uh, making sure that, um, you know, they are presented in a, a respectful way. Um, also uh, important to gather before you go to your interview is to get some background information on your subject. So there is a form that I'll share in a minute here that'll give you some, some kind of initial information to discuss. Um, so this is our uh, initial contact form. Uh, this is available for download, uh, which you can see there, uh, messelmuseum.org slash missing history. This is our, our kind of place for all the documents and links and videos to live uh, for this moment. So when you're uh, contacting someone, it's going to be important to know maybe when their birthday was, um, you know, what era they grew up in, what career they had, um, so that you can kind of tailor your questions to that. Um, so for example, if they were born in 1941 and they were only four years old when World War II ended, it would not make sense for us to ask them what they did in the service. Um, they're not going to have a whole lot of memories of World War II, uh, but by calculation, they, they would definitely have some memories of the Vietnam War, um, you know, maybe um, the 1968 uh, race riots, those kinds of things. Um, so kind of know your time period and it's very easy to, um, to kind of go through uh, even just Wikipedia to see what happened in, you know, 1941, what happened in 1968. Um, so give yourself a couple of pointers that you want to make sure that you have ready to go to ask. So this will help us get all of that in it'll document when you actually talk to that person um, and when you, um, you know, made that initial uh, call. So this is the oral history release. Um, again, very important for you to give permission to the museum uh, to be able to help students, teachers, um, people who are interested in learning, um, you know, share it on social media, share it as part of a documentary and an eventual exhibit here at the museum. So. Very important. Um, also, just to make sure that, you know, they legally understand that, you know, this is being shared with people. So again, research the, the time period so that you know what topics to focus on or what questions to ask. Um, and sometimes their questions can lead you in a direction that you weren't uh, expecting, and that's okay. And maybe there's some event that you don't even know happened during that time period, and that's okay too. Um, just you want to come to it at least mildly prepared so that you don't um, you know, so that you don't sound ill-prepared or, or uninformed. Uh, what our eventual goal is to, uh, is to either scan, borrow and scan photographs and letters, uh, or photograph artifacts, 
uh, or to accept donations to uh, the museum from, from citizens uh, with those photographs, letters, artifacts, um, any of those things. That is an eventual goal. We're not quite at that point where we're accepting a lot of things yet, um, but just keep that in mind that you can share with them that we are in fact um, looking to do that. Um, specifically during your interview, if uh, if the person you're interviewing can bring photographs, um, even if it's on Zoom and they can just at least hold it up in front of the camera, um, that's really what sparks a lot of, of memories is photographs uh, things that you can tangibly hold that have a memory associated with it. Um, that'll really help, you know, bring out the, the memories. And uh, sometimes you can actually get uh, people to help you identify photographs that, you know, maybe are unidentified. Um, so that's a, that is a, a great idea. And if they don't have any, that's okay too. Um, it's just a, just a suggestion. Um, so, uh, always have a few prompts, uh, some typed up questions to kind of get you started. You know, we usually use the, you know, where were you born and, you know, who are your parents, that kind of thing. Um, I do have a list here at the end uh, that we can look at and you can kind of pick and choose. Uh, again, that list of questions is part of our website. So massillemuseum.org slash missing history. So it is perfectly acceptable while you were interviewing to get off topic. Um, you may want to kind of rein some people back in if they get way off topic to something that, you know, isn't, uh, you know, it isn't what you're looking to record, um, but it's okay to, to get off topic. You don't have to go down the list of questions that we've prepared and hit exactly everyone. Um, pretty much any time I've ever conducted an interview, we skip five to 10 questions um, because there was something else that was so much more exciting that we talked about and that is okay. Um, keep in mind that the, the memory of anybody, any person whatsoever is not 100% accurate. And uh, especially if you are interviewing uh, an elderly person, uh, you're asking them to go back, you know, 50 to 70 years to recall some memories that they maybe haven't thought of in a while, or maybe they kind of tucked back in the back. So be patient. Um, it's really important that after you ask a question and they stop talking, count to 10 uh, before speaking again, um, because when we get these these audio and video recordings, we don't want to hear you going, uh-huh, 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 oh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and then cutting them off um, at the, the, you know, as they start to talk again. So if you count to 10, it seems like a very, very, very long time, uh, especially when you're sitting with someone, but but give them that leeway, um, because sometimes it seems like they've done, they're done answering the question, um, but they're actually, you know, kind of searching back um, and getting to some of those memories, again, that they haven't thought of in a while. So if you count to 10 and they still haven't talked, um, go ahead and ask your next question. That's like the most challenging part of interviewing people is counting to 10. Um, so just give yourself a little space. So uh, in terms of equipment and how do we actually record all of these stories, um, I, what seems to me is going to be our kind of main way to record is going to be Zoom call recording. So you can sign up for a free account. And if there's just you and another person on the interview, you can for free um, you know, get in there and record, um, I think, 45 minutes if you've got several people. But you can record until you're, until you're done uh, with a free account. So it is, it is possible to, um, to set that up and, and spend no money whatsoever. Um, other ways that you can record, since we all typically have cell phones, you can take your cell phone and, and record someone uh, or bring a video camera or um, some other device. That is just fine. Um, I, I know that in the end, we're going to have varying qualities of video available for all of these interviews, and that's okay because we are capturing what we can capture safely at the time. So if you don't have access to any of those things, you don't have a laptop or a cell phone, or you really aren't comfortable using your own equipment, that is okay too. We are putting together a kit uh, that you can borrow from MassMe that will be sanitized uh, before and after. And it will include a camera or just recording equipment, some microphones, um, and will include a, a how-to kit um, for you to be able to know how to use it. Uh, and obviously we're available for questions all the time, so please, um, you know, reach out to us if you want to interview and you need that equipment. Um, if you're just doing audio, uh, there are very simple digital recorders. You can even use a tape recorder. Um, you 
you know, even though it's a technically outdated technology, we have the technology to take that tape and uh, bring it into a digital format, and that's okay too. Um, if you do a reel-to-reel -reel tape, however, I don't know that I have the technology, but we'll find a way to make it happen. Um, it's important to uh, bring spare batteries if you are using some sort of recorder. Um, we ask for a microphone just because it's easier to get close to your subject, um, but uh, that's okay if you don't have a microphone. Um, and your cell phone. Your cell phone can record audio only. Um, there's typically free apps uh, or even one that's built into your phone, um, which is kind of ready to go. Uh, and again, there's a there is a uh, a kit available from MassNew uh, for that purpose. So um, again, making sure that you actually have um, ample space, ample batteries, um, you know what whatever <laughs> you are in need of, we got to make sure that. Um, you know, that you have it ready to go. Um, most importantly, pen and paper um, to, to take notes, um, to uh, write down kind of the, the gist of what uh, is actually happening. And um, uh, it's important too, so that then when we go back and uh, we start to transcribe these things, we are, um, you know, we have that kind of reference as to, you know, at seven minutes in, he talked about going to school for the first time, um, you know, those kinds of things so that uh, we can go back later and kind of easily find those main topics. Um, and also it's a good space that if you're trying not to interrupt somebody, but you have a question, you can kind of scribble it in the margins. Um, and so these are my uh, my notes uh, from two different interviews that I did, one with David Cargill and one with Lolly Brooks. And um, as you can see, it's kind of a, a hot mess of, you know, trying to make eye contact while scribbling on a piece of paper. But uh, over in the margins there, um, you can kind of see that I've got, you know, a random time code that I've, you know, looking at my recording device, I've got seven minutes in. Um, you know, he talked about cowboy movies, which was pretty great. Um, so there's a lot of, um, yeah, a lot of, of good things that can come out of taking notes. So just do your best and bring them along and turn those in when you turn in an interview that you've done. So most importantly, and listening back to oral history interviews of, of yesteryear that we've digitized, um, make sure you have a good background. Um, you know, if we're going to be using this in a documentary, we don't want to be in front of trash cans. We don't want to be in front of um, the super bright window in the front that, you know, it kind of blows out the picture because it's so bright and your phone is trying to adjust the, the light and dark, um, you know, just pay attention to where you're actually actually shooting. Um, uh, make sure that there's no loud noises. Are you too close to traffic? Um, even something as silly as a refrigerator buzzing and in the background can um, can really hamper our ability to hear and understand uh, an interview. Um, and make sure that your subject is comfortable. So get them a, a comfortable chair if possible. Um, but not too comfortable so that everyone falls asleep, um, but uh, make sure that everyone is, is happy and comfy. So this is from an interview that um, I was a part of in 2010. Uh, we gathered up stories from Ravenswood, West Virginia and Monroe City, Missouri. Um, so in Monroe City, Missouri, the, the space that we were offered to record uh, oral histories was in a church. So kind of a, kind of a decommissioned church. So off to the side there, uh, you know, we've got, uh, you can kind of see we've got a little battery pack there uh, for a lavalier mic to record our two subjects. And um, uh, we've got uh, Alex Kuhn, our executive director, was interviewing. Uh, so you can see she's got notes there. Uh, and I'm listening with headphones to make sure that, um, uh, you know, that everything's going right, that no one's accidentally hitting the microphone. Um, so this is like my ideal situation. There's light, there's a camera with a good microphone and their microphone. Um, but obviously we know that this is not the case every time that you go to, uh, you know, to conduct an interview and that's okay. That's okay. There's ideal and then there's what we can make happen. But the point is that any scenario, we're recording people's stories. Uh, so here I have uh, Marvin Dodson, who I interviewed recently uh, about this project and a little bit about her life. And you can see I have pinned on her uh, jacket here a lavalier mic. 
Uh, we've got a backdrop. Uh, we've got proper lighting. Uh, again, ideal situation, but not necessarily what is going to happen every time. Uh, so a little bit more casual, uh, I interviewed Bernie Green in 2013, and uh, we had uh, our Fred F. Silk room. That was what was available, and I kind of tried to make the shot look good, but, you know, we were just kind of hanging out in front of some artwork, so that's okay, too. Uh, and Lolly Brooks uh, was kind enough to uh, invite me into her home, um, and we spoke uh, for several hours uh, about her life and experiences uh, growing up in uh, in Maslin, and she brought out a scrapbook. So uh, we were able to kind of look through, uh, again, as I said, like those those photos will really bring out um, good uh, good memories or, or bad memories, you know, you gotta take the good and the bad, um, but that was a really, um, really important piece of her interview. But again, like we're in her home, um, so it's never quite quite ideal, um, but we went and we gathered great stories. And there is her scrapbook. So this was the shot that I actually came up with when we were talking to her directly. Um, so, you know, you kind of leave out, um, you know, all of the rest of the, the room. So picking out a, a good spot, um, you know, and a good framing uh, if you're setting up any video. So our questions. Um, Again, these are just some guidelines and not necessary, but also, um, you know, to, to help you spur some conversation. So obviously starting from the very beginning, when were you born and where? Uh, who were your parents? Um, sometimes it's good to get down some genealogical information. So, you know, some kind of family tree stuff. Um, uh, talking about your siblings and uh, where you lived when you grew up. Um, what family traditions do you have? Um, this is a pretty cool one. I, I'm always interested to see what, what families have that are different from each other, but also the same. You know, what kinds of foods did you make? Um, what music did you listen to? What were, you know, the holidays and gatherings like? Um, and that's why I say describe a typical day with your family. Um, Cause again, it might seem like everyday stuff uh, you know, to the person who's interviewing, but to those of us who are decades removed from that time period, it can definitely be different and amazing to see what what is the same and what's different. Uh, where they went to school, um, uh, what was the most influential role model in your life? Um, you know, listening to people uh, and who inspired them. Uh, and of course, uh, are there any important family stories uh, that you wish to share, uh, which would be important, especially if there's, uh, you know, maybe a family member that's passed away and they can't tell us that story, um, but your your subject might um, know that story and can share it with you so that we have it documented somewhere. Um, so there you have it, there's part one. So these are kind of our, uh, a little bit more, um, I think we called it raw, uh, you know, covering actual race in Massillon. Um, you know, we want to know what life was genuinely like in the 1960s and 70s. You know, have you encountered racism growing up or now? Um, also looking at some of the big, you know, national events that might impact people's lives. Um, some race related, some not race related. Um, you know, how, how has your world changed and how did you interact with these, um, with these events? And also then looking at legacy, um, you know, looking at things that are happening today, what what might you want people to know about your specific African-American experience? Uh, and what is one thing you want your children to know or just children in general? Um, you know, what, <laughs> what, what good words of wisdom can we leave for the next generation? So once the uh, interview is complete, um, we ask that people upload video and audio, the forms, any notes you might have taken, um, that URL, maslamuseum.org slash missing history uploads will take you to a Google Drive where you can put things and we'll be processing those as we receive them. Um, we then are looking for volunteers to help just, uh, transcribe our audio and video. Um, so that means word for word, you know, transcript um, of that interview. And uh, obviously highlighting keywords as we go to make sure that we know, aha, they talked about, you know, going to the Lincoln Theater when they were kids or they attended Washington High School. Um, you know, we can kind of pull out some 
some moments that we can kind of connect if we're all talking, you know, we're taking everybody's views of Washington High School, uh, you know, we can kind of pull those uh, different pieces of interviews together for a documentary or for, uh, you know, for an exhibit. So then the museum staff and the volunteers um, will eventually, uh, probably starting in 2021, uh, we'll start uh, borrowing photographs and scanning them. Uh, also, you know, photographing uh, artifacts and um, all of those kinds of things. And uh, we'll start processing donations of artifacts probably mid to late um, 2021. And uh, our goal then is to have the exhibit in 2022. So again, we're, we're using all of these beautiful oral histories to uh, a variety of sources, uh, from a variety of sources to distribute in a lot of different ways. Um, we are going to take written histories or transcribed interviews and make those available online. Uh, these will make great resources for students and teachers. Um, we're hoping to make a video documentary available online and within the museum, uh, probably part of this exhibit uh, in 2022 and uh, make sound clips uh, playable in the galleries and that make sure that um, you know, everyone can listen to these great stories that everyone has shared with us. Um, obviously, there's going to be, you know, tons and tons of hours and hours and hours of stories, which is wonderful. That's exactly what we want to have. Um, but when presenting it in a uh, gallery setting, you're not going to sit down for 10 hours to listen to everybody's stories. Um, that's where we come in and we can kind of splice down and, and cut down to kind of the necessary parts and, um, you know, present it in a way that, you um, you know, that is exciting and interesting and uh, can help inform us about life in Maslin. So I'm gonna see if I can move this guy right here. There we go. Um, so if you have any questions, please feel free to email me, uh, give me a call. Uh, you can contact us then on uh, online. Uh, you can find us on the Facebook group, Missing History of Maslin, and then you can kind of keep up to date and download those documents on maslinmuseum.org uh, slash missing history. So that is our presentation. And thank you all so much for, for being here. And uh, we look forward to hopefully uh, working with you.